Thank you for joining us for today's expert lecture brought to you by Golden Eagle Luxury Trains. If you're new to our online lectures, then these are the type of lectures that you will find typically on board our luxury rail journeys. So you will, they'll be led either by one of our expert guest speakers or one of our expert tour managers, and they'll be tailored to the destinations that you're traveling through. So while we've been unable to operate our tours over the last 12 months, we've decided to bring these type of lectures to you virtually for you to enjoy and have a taste of the Golden Eagle travel experience from home. So my name is Natasha Baker and I'm obviously the marketing manager here at Golden Eagle Luxury Trains and it gives me great pleasure to welcome back our expert speaker for today, Miss Sophie Ibbotson. He'll be delivering this lecture for you on some of the new archaeological discoveries found in Central Asia. Now Sophie is a well-known writer, she's also a consultant for the World Bank and for the governments of Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. She's also Uzbekistan's ambassador for tourism and she's travelled extensively throughout this region, including on the Golden Eagle train as a guest speaker. So we're delighted to have her back with us today presenting to you. Now Central Asia and in particular the cities along the Silk Road feature heavily in our luxury rail programmes that we do on board the Golden Eagle. And we won't be covering the different types of journeys that we offer on the Silk Road in today's presentation, but we will be doing an online journey showcase in the coming months. So please stay tuned to our email newsletters for information about that. And if you'd like any more information sooner than that, then we do offer a video consultation service with our sales team. So please do get in touch with us and we can organise that for you. So thank you again for joining us and I will now hand over to our expert speaker, Sophie. Thank you very much for the introduction, Natasha, and welcome to all of you. I gather we have a, a large number of guests this evening from the United States. So good morning, good afternoon to you. Um, and obviously good, good evening to our friends in Europe. Um, my talk this evening, Keep Digging, New Archaeological Discoveries in Central Asia is pretty much as it says on the tin. I'm going to be introducing you to what I think are some of the most interesting archaeological sites that have been identified in Central Asia in the last few years and are being excavated right now. The talk is going to be divided into two parts and the first of these is a short history lesson and the reason is I want to talk about the context, what it is um, the reason that there are so many uh, intriguing archaeological sites in Central Asia and why they're being uh, discovered and worked on now. And then the second part of the talk is going to be talking about what I think are the most important fascinating sites that have been recently discovered. I've picked three different locations for you. One is in the Fergana Valley, which is a, a very fertile area of Central Asia shared between Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. The second site is in Sirkandaria region of Uzbekistan, in the south of the country, very close to the border with Afghanistan. And the third site is in Gabal, the Pamir region of Tajikistan, and that's what you can see on the picture here. The first thing I want to talk about is the ancient Silk Road, or as Peter Frankopan calls it, Silk Roads. And the plural, the S, is really, really important here because it wasn't that there was just one road connecting Europe, China. There were actually a network of interconnected trading routes that crisscrossed the entirety of Central Asia. The majority of them um, started uh, somewhere in Europe. Some people will tell you in Venice, in Istanbul, uh, or in Antioch, or possibly even in Syria. Um, but generally they, they worked their way east, um, across Turkey, Persia, Afghanistan, north into Central Asia and reaching up into Russia, south through Afghanistan, Pakistan and into the Indian subcontinent, east into China. The goods that travelled along the Silk Road, yes, there was silk, yes, there was textiles, but there were also all manner of other products, um, of minerals and metals, of ceramics, um, of technologies and of ideas as well because these trading routes were not just for physical goods, um, but people obviously traveled along with them and with them their ideas, their beliefs, their philosophies. 
A large number of these routes met in Central Asia, and this is very, very important for the talk this evening. In the map here, although it is a simplified version, that there is quite a, a knot of routes um, in the area. And this is largely to do with the physical geography of the region. Um, the physical geography, um, the combination of mountains and of deserts, meant that nature was dictating where the trading routes should go. There was no point in just setting out into the desert or into the steppe if you didn't know where you could find water, where you could find shelter. And so routes developed through the desert, jumping really from watering hole to watering hole through the oasis. And the same in the mountain regions, you couldn't risk being stranded at high altitude when the snow came down. You had to pick your route along over the passes through the mountains. Um, and therefore there is a there is a crisscrossing in Central Asia and the routes coming together. Another aspect that we have to think about in addition to the trade that is going is about the empires that were centered here historically. The Mongol Empire in particular, the Empire of Genghis Khan, was the largest in history until it was overtaken by the British Empire in 1920s. And yet it is a, a empire that was thriving 800 years. The empires that were centred here brought a degree of stability to the region. It meant that the, the rulers were able to concentrate their wealth, build cities, and that stimulated a, a population boom. We know in fact that in the, the early 13th century, the largest cities in the world, Gurganj and Merv, were both in Central Asia, in fact in what is modern day uh, Turkmenistan. And both of those cities had populations of over half a million people. That's still larger than um, many European uh, towns and cities today. But in the period when we think about the total global population, actually this meant that they were absolutely vast. You can see the remains of, of some of these cities there. Um, where there was a population density and where there was a concentration of wealth, there was obviously a need to protect it. The rulers often would build um, fortifications to protect their, their population and the merchants and the bazaars inside from, from bandits and from the elements. And you can see at the top here the fortified walls at Merv in Turkmenistan and at the bottom the three fortresses on the site of the Ayaz Kala in Uzbekistan. So huge walls being built to offer physical protection. Uh, they're also there though not only to physically protect, but also to project the power of the rulers who uh, founded and occupied the cities. If you think this is a way of controlling um, the narrative, one's empire, one's army, saying not only can we subdue you as a population, but we can also um, make a physical mark on the natural environment. We can dominate the landscape. We can change what the place looks like with the size of our walls, the impressiveness of our monuments, and we can make the population feel actually they will do anything uh, that we ask of them because we're such a, a powerful, great ruler. The monuments were very important in that respect. Um, if you think we have fortified citadels, elaborate palaces, places of worship, bazaars, burial sites, and also the supporting infrastructure for it. One of the things that is often easy to forget when we look at the ruins today is that these were very sophisticated civilizations. Um, the remains of mud brick architecture, particularly once it has been eroded after a thousand years or more, um, we forget actually the, the sophistication of the, the engineering and the construction, but also the quality of the decoration and the number of artisans who worked on it and the wealth that the cities must have had in order to be able to afford to support a class of artisans whose only uh, role within the society was to make it uh, beautiful. They were not there to produce food, they were not farmers, they weren't warriors protecting the sites, they were there to beautify it, um, which I think is a, a very wonderful thing, but it, it says something about the society. Um, they were people with 
knowledges of maths and of science, an appreciation for the fine arts. Some of the um, images here, obviously the uh, top left and bottom right are both murals excavated from two of the most important um, well-known archaeological sites in Central Asia. Penja Kent is in the northwest of the country, quite close to the border with Uzbekistan, and there are ongoing excavations there led by the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Um, at the bottom, the mural is Afro Sayab was the um, is the historic part of Samarkand. And so when you go to Samarkand on a Golden Eagle tour, you will have the opportunity to visit Afro Sayab and the Afro Sayab Museum as well, if it is something that interests you. These really dazzling artifacts um, have been steadily excavated predominantly by the Soviet archaeologists, but uh, in the last few years by uh, archaeologists from the independent countries. Um, they're available to see in world collections. If you go to the British Museum, for example, you'll be able to see the Oxus treasure, the exquisite gold work that was um, probably originated in southwest Tajikistan, uh, but was found by the British in the 19th century after it had been excavated and was brought to London and to other international collections. Um, the State Hermitage Museum, because of the role of Soviet archaeologists in excavating these sites and their ongoing involvement in Penj Kent, um, there is a, a large number of the, the murals and the other uh, visually appealing artefacts are in the State Hermitage Museum. But when you travel in Central Asia, fortunately, Many of these uh, artifacts have remained in the countries and there are some fantastic national museums and uh, museums specialising in archaeology and antiquities that you are able to visit. Um, I particularly recommend the national museums in Tashkent, the archaeological museum in Termiz in southern Uzbekistan, which has got particularly fine Buddhist finds, and then the um, National Museum of Antiquities in Dushanbe, Tajikistan and there you'll find the Sleeping Buddha that you can see in the top right picture here as well as beautiful murals, ceramics and so on and so forth. On this slide I have put just a, a small selection of the archaeological sites which you can visit in Central Asia um, from across the region, so from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. You might be wondering why so many of these sites have survived. Well, the first reason goes back to the point I made earlier about the um, size of the population and the wealth of the population centres. And so the, a huge number of sites existed in the first place. There were, there were cities and fortifications and uh, monasteries and so on and so forth that were built. So one, we started with a large, large number of buildings which could in theory uh, become of historic interest over time. The reason that they have survived um, to the present day are really very important, however. One of those is the climate of the region. Large parts of Central Asia, including the mountain, many of the mountain areas, are desert. Um, some of them are deserts, the, the dusty flat deserts that you might expect, deserts like the, the Kizilkum and the Karakum, which mean the, the red desert and the black desert, uh, but also large parts of Tajikistan are high altitude desert. So although you have the snow-capped um, mountains, you actually have very, very little rainfall. And the um, I did read somewhere that the, the rainfall in Central Asia is about a quarter of that in East Asia. And therefore, a lot of the uh, mud brick architecture and stone structures as well, but it is predominantly mud brick, just haven't been eroded over time. Another point that we have to consider is that although a thousand years ago or more, there were many very large population centres in Central Asia, for much of the subsequent history, that has not been the case. Um, Genghis Khan, uh, I mean, devastated a number of these cities. Um, not only did he slaughter huge numbers of people, as did uh, Amir Timur um, a few generations later, and many of the populations never recovered. Um, they abandoned their cities, they dispersed, um, and uh, 
there was never again, probably until the 20th century, uh, cities of comparable size. Cases where um, cities and settlements were built along the courses of rivers, and when those rivers changed their direction, the populations were no longer able to exist in the same areas and had to move to new locations. Um, particularly important cities where we can think of that being a factor. Um, one in um, Konyora Gench in Turkmenistan, and the second, Kampir Tepe, which I'm going to be talking about a little later on today. This is important because it meant that um, subsequent cities were not built on top of older cities. Um, if you think of a city like Bath in the UK, we can go back to the Roman period, but because the city has been continually occupied in the intervening period, there is layer upon layer of development um, and you have to dig very deep to find the, the Roman layers and you disturb many layers in between. That wasn't the case in Central Asia because there was so much space density by that stage was quite low. Populations didn't need to build on top of older cities. Generally, if um, for whatever reason an area was no longer habitable, they would simply up sticks and move to another area. You even find this in a place like Samarkand, which has been inhabited for um, two and a half, three thousand years, that although um, Afro Sayab, uh, the archaeological site is still there. It is not that the medieval city was built next door. And that's a fantastic thing for archaeologists because they don't have to disturb the modern city. They don't have to demolish 1960s architecture on the whole uh, to get down there. They don't have to move the medieval monuments. They can simply start digging in the original city. The Soviets were incredibly important in the history of uh, archaeology and excavation in Central Asia. And they are the ones who introduced, one, an interest in archaeology, but secondly, um, a scientific approach to how it was done in the excavation and in the recording of findings from archaeological sites. They worked on identification, on excavation, preservation, of sites and in some cases restoration. It's the restoration which is sometimes controversial because there were cases where um, in the restoration process there was a prioritization of making it look nice and look impressive and some damage was done to underlying structures um, but generally the the quality of work has been very very good and it is something that has continued in uh, the period since the countries became independent in 1991. Um, there has been much uh, revived interest in history in each of the Central Asian republics and particularly in Uzbekistan and this feeling that national history is something which has to be uh, better discovered, better appreciated because it is the birthright of the country and it is a way of creating an identity in some ways from scratch out of the um, Soviet melee and creating an identity for a country with borders which were until the 20th century uh, defined as we as we know them today. Um, so the, the sites are there, they are ready to, uh, in, in some cases have been identified and are, are being excavated. Um, there is from international archaeologists, not just local groups, um, and international teams are in general providing the cutting edge technology and expertise to ensure that uh, work is done to the highest standards. And I particularly, if you're interested in this, look at what UCL, uh, University College London, is doing. They're doing some fantastic work in Central Asia at the moment using satellite imagery and drone photography to identify and map archaeological sites and then digitizing the, the records so that they are accessible to researchers across Central Asia and beyond. On this map um, I've put on the, the three sites that I am uh, going to be talking about this evening. Um, 
obviously the the names are stretched out but the the location of the sites roughly corresponds with the numbers uh, one two and three site one is a megalithic civilization in the fergana valley site two is alexandria on the oxus which is near to the modern city of Termiz in southern Uzbekistan. And number three is Castle, Castle Karon, a citadel on the edge of the Pamirs in Tajikistan. I've picked these three sites because they come from very different periods. They had different functions and characters. Um, and also I think they're just in terms of our understanding of the ancient history of Central Asia um, very, very important. They all have something different to offer. Here are a few of the pictures of the megaliths in the Fergana Valley. At first glance, yes, they do look like piles of rocks, um, but I am going to assure you that they are actually um, historic sites of great importance and, quite frankly, great reason for excitement. Megaliths are prehistoric stone structures and often they have ritual purpose. The two most famous examples worldwide would be Stonehenge, which is the English heritage site in southern UK, and also Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. The earliest megaliths um, date from seven to 8,000 years ago, and there are megalithic sites wanting that early people um, links many early societies together. The sites, um, including these in, in the photographs in the Fergana Valley, were first identified and mentioned in, in the night. Um, the archaeologist identified a few sites that were potentially of interest, but there was never any excavation done. And there's a number of reasons for this. Firstly, um, a pile of rocks like this, possibly at, at face value, is, is not as exciting monuments that might have murals or gold or um, other sort of exciting things that will capture people's imagination. Secondly, we have to remember that this was just after the collapse of the Soviet Union when Uzbekistan was newly independent and there were other priorities. Um, there was no money for this kind of work and certainly other priorities. So although a couple of the sites were noted, nothing was, was done about them. Scroll forward to 2020, however, and a small expedition led by Beroz Hamzaev, who's a former guide, um, working with two um, archaeologists, Vladimir Karasev and Konstantin Krakmal. Um, they decided to, to lead a, or to run a, an archaeological uh, survey in the Fergana Valley, and they identified almost 200 uh, locations in the valley where there were sites which are definitely megaliths or probably megaliths and the number and spread of these sites suggests evidence that they um, there must have been an extensive and, and previously unknown megalithic civilization in Central Asia. This wasn't isolated sites, it was a network um, of, of, of megaliths across the entire area. The assumption so far is that these sites were probably made by the Sakas, who were an Iranic people inhabiting the Eurasian steppe and the Tarim Basin in the first millennium BC. The pictures I showed you in the previous slide looked at the sites side on and they did in some cases look just like piles of stone. When you look at the sites from above, however, uh, when you take a, a bird's eye view as, as has been done in the, the diagram here, you can see that the stones have been deliberately placed. They're not accidental, it's not random. The circular shape in particular was of great symbolic importance. It was believed that the soul of the dead must pass through many circles in order to be purified and that the center of a circle could connect with another dimension. This gives us an indication or an insight into the beliefs of the people who built it, but also teaches us that they must have had quite a, a comprehensive understanding of uh, geometry. We also know from the positioning of the stones 
that these were people who studied the stars and had some understanding of astronomy. Just as with Stonehenge in the UK, many of these structures in the Fergana Valley were aligned with constellations or with astronomic events, occasions such as the solstice and the equinox. So these were early scientists as well as people with uh, religious beliefs and it points to a sophisticated society who not only made observations but were also able to analyse what they were looking at um, and have it inform their belief. One other point which I think is also worth noting is that many of these myths are on top of hills or on top of mountains, not just in, in flat areas. This would have been a great effort to have moved the stones up to the top of the hill. Um, and what it means is that when somebody is buried within these structures, it was probably a person of great importance within the community. Um, it meant that the community was prepared to come together to invest the time and effort in moving the stones up to the top of the hill in order to remember them perhaps um, and to ensure that their soul would have an easy transition to the next life. One of the sites and probably the most significant one that was discovered during the, the 2020 survey has been nicknamed the Valley of the Kings. Um, obviously that's a name that evokes the uh, site of the same name in ancient Egypt. Um, Uzbekistan's uh, own Valley of the Kings it is slightly different, but this is where there is the highest concentration of uh, megaliths in the Fergana Valley. And in this particular valley, there is a quarry, which is where the stones would have been uh, mined from, but also more than 50 megalithic structures. One of these is an observatory with three concentric circles, all of which, uh, the stones in which were very precisely placed in order to get accurate measurements. Um, now that the existence of these sites has been noted and recorded, there is a plan to begin excavation on those which are considered most important and it's hoped that the excavation will begin uh, in the next few months, um, although if any, uh, due to the number of the sites it, it is a project which, which no doubt will take many many years. I do hope however that by excavating a number of these megaliths we will be able to find out more about the society that created them, how they lived, how they made these structures and why they made them. Um, that for me I think is the, the most fascinating question of all. I'm going to move on now to talk about the second site which has two names confusingly. One is Campiatepe and the second is Alexandria on the Oxus. Now Alexander the Great founded more than 70 cities that he called Alexandria. The famous one of course was in Egypt, but there were also Alexandrias in Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, in fact almost everywhere this army conquered. Ptolemy, the, the Greek historian, wrote about Alexandria on the Oxus, but until very recently we didn't know where this city was. Some of the Alexandrias are easy to find, but Alexandria seems to have completely disappeared. Um, it existed in the text and Ptolemy gave a good description of it, but the exact location of it in the, the modern world was unknown. There were various theories about where Alexandria on the Oxus might be. One was Old Temiz in southern Uzbekistan, another was Aikanum in Afghanistan, but there were always questions. The, uh, archaeological discoveries in these sites just didn't quite match with the description that Ptolemy uh, sources that we were able to draw upon. So I visited Campiatepe, uh, seen in this picture, in 2015 and it was a very very beautiful site, very empty, um, there was only myself and the group of tourists I was with and we didn't realise its importance other than it was clearly quite an extensive city site. The veteran archaeologist Edward Fertladze discovered Campiatepe in 1972 and he has been excavating the site 
every season since then. And for a number of years, he has had um, a gut hunch, essentially, that Campe Tempe might actually be Alexandria on the Oxus. And in summer 2019, he realised that he or was, was convinced that he had amassed sufficient evidence to um, prove the connection and announced officially at an archaeological congress that Campe Tepe was indeed Alexandra and the Oxus. The thing that had confused him earlier and made it difficult was Alexandra on the Oxus, the name uh, Alexandria built on the Oxus River and the Oxus River no longer flows past the site. Uh, if you look at the top right picture here, you can see the archaeological site and then lush green fields. And if you went right to the horizon in that picture, you would get to the Oxus River or the Amudaria, as it is, is now known in Central Asia. Um, the reason for this is that although the city was built on the river, in the intervening two and a half thousand years, the river has changed its course. And it was this factor that meant the city had to be abandoned. Um, without a, a water supply, it was no longer feasible to live here. There also appears to have been an earthquake sometime in the second century AD, and that buried much of what was left of the city. It did, however, preserve the buildings in the sound. And what um, but Vladze and his, his colleagues have been able to do is layer by layer to, to remove the, the debris and to discover the city underneath. The key finds that they have made and which have convinced them that it is indeed Alexandria on the Oxus are the discovery of the Furion, which was a, a Greek and Macedonian form of watch post, and harbour, all of which are characteristic of a Hellenistic settlement. The main gates at Campo Tepe were built to exactly the same design as those at Cilium in southern Turkey, which Alexander the Great had besieged in 333 BC. Coins depicting the Greek god Apollo, um, and there's cartographic evidence as well. Perhaps the, the strongest evidence, however, is the, the dating of the layers of the site. And they have concluded that Campo Tepe was founded in, in the 320s BC, which means it was exactly contemporary with Alexandria's Transoxaniana uh, campaign. This is the last site that I'm going to talk to you about, and it's probably the one which excites me most. I wrote about it uh, two years ago for the Telegraph newspaper, and they called it the Machu Picchu of uh, Central Asia. And from this photograph, you can see why. It's the, the sort of the pyramid of a mountain behind and then this, this lost city in the foreground. I first went to Tajikistan in, in 2010 um, and for a decade had driven past this site many, many times without any idea that it was there. Um, I was able to visit in, in 2019 when I, when I took this photo and I hope to get back in September this year. Campi Tepe, uh, Campi Tepe, I've spoken about Campi Tepe. <laughs> Castle Caron was only discovered since 2012. The landowner who, who had this uh, piece of land just outside the, the modern town of Kalakum found this very unusual looking structure that you can see in the pictures on the left and at the top um, on his land. An archaeologist called Yusuf Yakubov to come and have a look at it. And Yakubov is was probably the most famous archaeologist in Tajikistan and for many years he had been running the archaeological excavations at Penchkent. The first thought um, was that it was some kind of burial monument. Um, it does, particularly if you look at the picture at the top right, look as if it could be some sort of mausoleum. But they realised quite quickly this wasn't the case because there is no chamber inside. And if it was a burial place, there had to be somewhere to put the body. The structure is built on a, a cross-shaped base and almost like a ziggurat, it has been built up in layers. Now the, the cross-shaped base, the, the form of this structure, um, has some links with the, the Zoroast Zoroastrian symbol for the fire and for the sun. And that is, that is a, an important point in the hypothesis of what this, this building was used for. 
As they started studying it in more detail, they realized there was also a ritual basin fed by a water pipe. Um, and again, the sort of the idea started taking shape that this was, was not a burial monument at all, but in fact, a Zoroastrian fire temple. And there are architectural uh, parallels with certain fire, pardon me, certain ancient fire temples in Iran, but there are no other examples um, known in Central Asia. And so it makes this completely unique. It could have been left at that, but Yakubov got very, very neat why it might be that there was a Zoroastrian fire temple far from anywhere in the middle of Tajikistan. He and his team started uh, excavating the, or initially surveying the site and um, realized that actually it wasn't just a, a standalone monument, that under the uh, loose soil, and particularly as you went up the hill, there were more and more and more structures. In fact, there was an entire city lying beneath the sandy soil. In less than a decade, they have found the citadel, part of which is, is shown in this photograph here. They have found a polo field with a stadium uh, for 10,000 spectators. And to me, this is absolutely extraordinary because today this is a very sparsely populated uh, part of Tajikistan. Um, and in order to find 10,000 people, you would have to go, I mean, days and days walk away. Um, and this points to the fact that actually at the time, uh, Karon must have had a substantial population living within the city, but also in the peripheral communities as well, all of whom it seemed had a taste for watching polo matches. Um, Yakubov and his team have also found a water temple, which seems to have been dedicated to a river deity, evidence of gold mining and processing, a customs post and an observatory with an astrolabe. The structures at Karon are fantastically well preserved because they were buried. Um, what Yakubov has been doing is working to uncover them bit by bit. There is no intention of rebuilding them. And in fact, what you see is here is, has not been rebuilt. It has simply been uncovered and the, the sand and the mud cleaned out. Every season they have to be recovered uh, in order to, to protect them from the wind and rain. But there is hope that in the future funding will be made available to um, put some sort of, of covers over them so that it can be left open but protected and tourists will be able to to visit and explore as I have done. When you travel across Central Asia with with Golden Eagle um, you will get to see some phenomenal Silk Road sites including the UNESCO cities, fortresses, mosques, mausoleums and more. One thing that I am going to say to you though is make sure that you also look out from the windows of the train and um, when you get off the train from the bus because as the desert and steppes and mountains there are hundreds if not thousands of archaeological treasures still buried um, in the ground and, and forgotten. And often from the train, you will see very curious mounds, you will see misshapen hills, um, you will see hills which seem to have terraces cut into them. And these are all evidence of the ancient past of Central Asia. Um, realistically, not all of them are, in fact, a great number of them are never going to be excavated. The exciting thing is those that are excavated, you never know exactly what you're going to find underneath. Um, I, would, I would recommend to you, if you are passionate about archaeology and you really want to learn about the ancient history of the region, a number of Golden Eagles tours start or finish in Almaty, um, and you do have the option with the company to have a, a few days before or after your tour. Um, ask Golden Eagle about this because their, their ground agent, particularly in this, is superb and would certainly be able to organise site visits for you to the sites I've talked about today and to many of the others and to provide you with an expert guide, local guide, um, with an interest in archaeology to explain to you as you explore them for yourself. I think I will leave it there and I will hand back to 
uh, Natasha, because I expect there are lots of questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Sophie. That was another wonderful lecture that you've just presented to us then. And it's just making me and probably everyone else that's watching just want to travel back to Central Asia and to, to get back on board any form of transportation right now to take us somewhere adventurous. So I really appreciate your lecture and thank you again for everyone who's joined us today. We have had some questions come through already, so I'll, I'll get round to some of those in a minute. But just to say, if anyone missed Sophie's previous lecture that she did with us a few weeks ago, um, again, in Central Asian um, theme, it was of the the legacy of Tamerlane or uh, Amir Tamur, and it was a brilliant lecture, and it is still available on our YouTube channel to, to watch back. So if you did miss that, then you uh, you can go back there. Also, today's recording will be available tomorrow for you to watch back. But as we said earlier, um, the question and answer section below, you can send your questions through. I'll get around to the first one um, now, Sophie. It's just said, is it thought that any of the sites in the Fergana Valley were linked in any way with the astrolo uh, astrological work of Ulugbeg? So Ulugbeg was the grandson of Tamerlane, and he was a very famous astronomer as well as a ruler in his own right. Um, you can visit his uh, madrasa and also his observatory when you go to Samarkand. I don't think there is a link, or not a direct link, between the sites in the Fergana Valley and Ulugbeg's studies, simply because of the length of time between them. Um, so Ulugbeg, uh, with uh, 15th, 15th, 16th century. Um, so at least two and a half thousand years after the sites in the Fergana Valley were created. However, there may be an indirect link um, because the, the interest in astronomy um, is, is something which I think has been felt in Central Asia for thousands of years and would have continued um, in the, in the period between when the megalithic sites were built and when Ulug Beg was uh, doing his studies, um, there has always been a, a very strong uh, interest in the, sort of the science of astronomy, but also in this wishing to uh, anticipate and then predict the future. So both the astronomy and the astrology, uh, there is a, a tradition of both in Central Asia and Ulug Beg may well have been influenced by the sort of indigenous interest in uh, astronomy and also by the uh, books that he read by earlier astronomers from India and by other astronomers in the Middle East and other parts of the Islamic world. Yeah, very interesting that if that was a, a link in between there. The sites that you've discussed today, obviously, I know you mentioning that obviously people that are traveling on our train or if they're traveling to Central Asia independently can obviously go and see some of these sites. Because of the distance that they are obviously apart from each other, if they could only visit one site, which, for example, which one would you, which one would you say was, would be not to miss? Out of these three, um, I would say the best one to go to is Campe Tepe in terms of accessibility. Um, and the reason for that is that it's quite easy to get from any of the other uh, cities in Uzbekistan to Termiz. You can take a domestic flight, you can take the train, and there is a huge concentration of archaeological sites around there. So there is, there is Camp Tepe, Alexandria on the Oxus, but you also have two very, very important Buddhist uh, monasteries at Fayez Tepe and Kara Tepe. Old Termiz itself is fantastic. Um, there is... Uh, Medieval uh, Muslim complexes, you have got um, Kirkiz, the fortress and caravanserai. So archaeology lovers should go to Temiz and then be able to see all of those things in, in one go. OK, I think what we'll do is thank you, everyone, for joining us. I think we will wrap it up here because of the technical difficulties that we're having. Thank goodness it was right at the end and it wasn't in the middle of the uh, of, uh, selfie. So I uh, appreciate your time, Sophie. Thank you very much for that. And everyone sending such lovely comments through. So any questions that we haven't been able to answer, uh, we'll speak to Sophie after today's um, session and I'll get back to you later. Thank you very much, Natasha.